Well, thanks, Rafi. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about several pests, uh, starting with uh, uh, Spotted Drosophila and some other invasives. Then I'll try and talk about a few established uh, pests too, just to keep it uh, well rounded. And there'll be one that's completely new. It's so new it's not even here yet. Okay. So. Up down here. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. The first is, is uh, spotted wing drosophila, which is a, the center fly here in, in, in the, the, the center fly in, in this, uh, these three images. There, there was some discussion just now at, at, at our table that the way you recognize spotted wing drosophila in the male is with that spot on the wing. But you have to look at where the spot is located. There are other native drosophilids that have spots on the wings too. Uh, in the middle of the wing, for example. But this dark spot on the leading edge of the tip of the wing is very typical of spotted wing drosophila. The female does not have a spot. You have to look for the ovipositor, which you can see with the hand lens. Uh, the fly on the right, I'll, I'll be coming to, that's the African fig fly. Now, uh, the, the berries really uh, everywhere are subject to, uh, to spotted wing drosophila infestation. A couple of crops are borderline, for example, grapes. Uh, in, when it was first introduced into California, uh, which was a, a couple of years before we got it, it was it's uh, thought not to really be a big problem in grapes, uh, infesting, infesting grapes if they're already split by something else. <clears throat> what we're seeing in the east is we, we do see them getting into grapes uh, in commercial uh, settings. And it's partly, well, it's, it's some, because of some related factors. Uh, drosophilids like humidity. They don't like hot and dry. And in California, it's, it's hot and dry. And so our environment is, uh, has environmental conditions that are better for spotted wing drosophila. Related to that, because of the added rainfall, we have a lush environment outside our planting. So there are a lot of wild hosts for spotted wing drosophila. And uh, the, the grape clusters on the left had a sour rot. You could smell uh, vinegar, uh, acetic acid, when you're handling the clusters. And I see two of the larvae. Now, if you're uh, indirect marketing, we call them larvae, not maggots. Customers don't want to hear maggots. <laughs> Uh, we first thought that it would be a problem in thin-skinned red varieties, and sure enough, uh, you see uh, some larvae in, in uh, this uh, berry that's broken open. That is uh, uh, taken this year. But we also see them in whites, which was the, the bad news. Uh, the, the, the bad news is that they seem to go into whatever grape variety is ripening after the previous variety is harvested. So regardless of whether they're uh, reds or whites, that's the bad news. The good news was that in most fruit of uh, the, the, the berry crops, the risk starts just when the berries are beginning to color up and, and ripen. So I was afraid that in grapes, uh, this would start at verasion, the, the point, uh, point of uh, where ripening really starts. And that hasn't borne out. Uh, the, the, the risk in grapes really begins to pick up when they're about 15 degrees bricks. And that's good news, because that means fewer sprays have to be applied which eases resistance management. You don't have to worry about rotating among mode of action classes so, uh, so rapidly. Now, with uh, drosophilid eggs, they generally have a pair of respiratory horns uh, stick, uh, protruding from one end of the, 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 the egg. You can see that kind of in the, uh, in the left two a pair of photographs. The picture on the right is a blueberry at Kentland Farm, our research farm. You can see these project, uh, these egg, uh, the respiratory horn sticking out. When the female inserts the egg into the berry and pulls free, she leaves those respiratory horns protruding, which you can see with a hand lens. Now here, the, uh, here are, this is a, a red variety, a Petit Verdot. You can see the, uh, this is in the lab, uh, with the uh, respiratory horn sticking out, a white variety as well, uh, Viognier. Uh, this is another fly that has turned up about a year later. Uh, this is African fig fly. Uh, for a while, we were calling it the NASCAR fly because of the racing stripes until we found out uh, what it is. But this was introduced in, into South America and uh, where it was causing problems in figs. Uh, now, uh, apparently, a second introduction took place from West Africa into uh, Florida. And now it, it, it can't overwinter here. It overwinters down in Florida and has to move up each year. So it'll be a mid to late summer issue for us. But some of the grape clusters we brought back to the lab expecting to rear out spotting drosophila had 90% African fig fly emerge. 
One interesting thing uh, about this genus of flies, Zaprianus, it has four respiratory filaments. So you see the egg on the right has four of those little respiratory hairs uh, from, uh, protruding from the end. Now, it has a little weak ovipositor, similar to the native Drosophilus. It doesn't have the big ovipositor that's serrated and armored the way spotted wing Drosophila does. And so what may be happening is maybe um, following injury made by spotted wing Drosophila and then outcompeting it. The only numbers I, I need you to look at uh, on this, uh, is, uh, th this slide, uh, is in the red box. First of all, over on the, the left, uh, the treatments are uh, four spotted wing c combined with four African fig fly compared with eight spotted wings. So in each of these treatments, in each of these little pieces of diet, there are eight larvae. Uh, in one treatment, it's four and four. Uh, now, in the red square, you see that the larval mortality of spotted wing is more than double when it is uh, uh, in the presence of African fig flies. So these flies look like they're out-competing and causing higher death in spotted wing Drosophila. So when we are talking about managing spotted wing Drosophila, uh, there are several things we have to keep in mind. First of all, we have to use things that work, naturally enough. You know, so we, we have to have uh, effective materials. We have to worry about different mode of action classes, the IRAC code that's on the most labels. You see the second column there are the, the IRAC mode of action. And then, uh, that we, so you had to rotate among uh, materials with uh, uh, differing modes of action that have a short PHI because these are in berries that are, are ripening. And we also have to worry about the maximum number of applications per season that were allowed for each product. And that's why it was good news on grapes that we only have to start worrying at 15 degrees bricks because we don't have to worry about rotating and using so many applications. Now one thing to keep in mind, whether it's cane berries or blueberries or, or grapes or cherries, uh, if, if you know that you're going to be targeting spotted wing Drosophila, uh, don't use the effective materials earlier in the season for other pests uh, if, if you have choices. Save those useful applications for when they're targeting spotted wing Drosophila. Now, we, we feel that chemical control alone won't be sustainable in, in the long run because of the selection pressure for resistance. This species has uh, 12 to 15 generations per season and an average of 350 eggs per female. So there's a lot of chance for selection for resistance. So we would like to foster other tactics. Now, uh, I have a student that start, just started a survey of natural enemies, of parasitoids that attack spotted wing Drosophila. Uh, what, what we, uh, we have spotted wing in colony we have Drosophila melanogaster, a native species in colony, and we have African fig fly in colony. So we put out a diet, either artificial diet or a, a seasonal fruit, out in the field for, uh, for about three days. And then we get uh, a known species composition so that we can see what parasitoids attack each species. Um, my student Jamie working on this is uh, on, the, on the left. My student Meredith, who's working on other aspects of spotted wing, is, is on the right. Um, we, uh, Jamie has succeeded in rearing natural enemies. This is a, a little parasitoid wasp that specializes in Drosophilids. Unfortunately, we have reared nothing from spotted wing Drosophila so far, uh, which makes sense because it's exotic. It was introduced here without its specialist natural enemies. And one thing about spotted wing, it has a high load of hemocytes that are defensive cells in the blood, kind of like our white blood cells, that uh, encapsulate natural enemies. So it has higher natural defense against parasitoids. But we're trying to document what's here already. Uh, there are, are other entomologists that are searching in China and Japan for specialist natural enemies. So hopefully if they can find something, then it might be something that we would be able to release. This is a new invasive. This is one that I said is so new it's not even here. I want you to be familiar with it and know what it looks like. Uh, this has been introduced into Pennsylvania. And so far, that's the only state where it's known. But I'll explain the, the, the risk in a, in, a, in a minute. This is spotted lanternfly. It's another pest from China. Uh, here we have it with a wing spread. It's a very pretty insect. I mean, I, I'm an entomologist, so I, I'm biased. But I think a lot of people would find this one pretty. It's from all over Asia, 
Uh, but in 2008, it started to expand its range and reach uh, Korea for the first time. And it was thought that it's expanding its range now because of warming winters. Now, you have to keep in mind what constitutes warming winters in Korea might be different than for us because the Korean Peninsula has pretty severe winters. Uh, it was introduced into Pennsylvania in 2014, just this past fall. And there are five townships and two boroughs quarantined now for uh, spotted lanternfly. The two favorite host plants are Tree of Heaven and grape, uh, Grapevines. But it has a wide host range beyond those two favorite plants. So it's, uh, I haven't seen data on most of the small fruits, but looking at the range of families there, there's a high chance that it will attack us uh, berry crops as well. It's a phloem feeder. It can occur in very high numbers, and um, in the literature it says they can cause wilting of entire trees. Short-range dispersal by flight, hopping, and walking. Long-range dispersal, movement, human movement of infested commodities or uh, egg masses. Now, this is why we're concerned in Virginia now. Uh, they lay their eggs on any smooth object, either smooth plant tissue or things like stone or, or rocks. Uh, on the right, you see an egg mass that was laid on a stone up in uh, Pennsylvania. The eggs are covered with a gray, waxy material, uh, but that eventually falls away at the time of hatching. Uh, for the, uh, the, there are four instars, four immature stages. The first three are black with white spots. The last is red with white spots. Very characteristic looking. Uh, they're, the adults are about an inch long. And I, I took the picture on the right with my hand in it so that you can get an idea of the size. These are pretty conspicuous insects. So the nymphs feed on a wide variety of plants. The adults appear in late July. They're, they're in, the, in the egg stage now in Pennsylvania. That's how they, they overwinter. And uh, not only do they remove a lot of sap, but they make a lot of honeydew, which will support sooty mold, which can decrease the photosynthesis of, pl of plants. So both the adults and the nymphs will aggregate in high numbers. You see here on, the, on this tree. So in the evening, uh, look on the, the, the trunk, and by day, look at the base of the plant. They move around a little bit diurnally, uh, differently. And look for eggs on smooth surfaces now. Uh, let's see. So if, if you see what you think is um, spotted lanternfly, let me know. We, we need to know. Uh, there, and uh, getting back to the reason why we're worried, this relates to how they lay their egg on any smooth surface. In the, the affected area in Pennsylvania, uh, there was a stone yard that uh, imported stone, and, you know, and then they shipped stone to different, different places that need it for, you know, uh, landscape architecture or whatever. Well, uh, they were in the affected area with lots of lanternflies around. There were two shipments before the quarantine was put in place into Virginia. And because of their tendency to lay eggs on stone, we need to go to those areas now and investigate and look for signs of establishment. These sites were, uh, around, uh, one was near Richmond, one was in the lower Shenandoah Valley. So uh, we'll, we'll be going this month to investigate to see if we can si uh, find any sign of eggs, and then we'll try and follow up during the season. But uh, this insect is very uh, unique looking, and so it, you know, it's, it might be something that, that you would be able to see if, uh, if you had it in, in your area. Now on the final slide, I'll have my email address and there's also the URL for our uh, website so that uh, you should be able to find more information and, and contact me. Uh, brown marmorated stink bug, this is a, an invasive pest, also found in Pennsylvania for the first time in the, in, uh, the, the US. Uh, it is bigger than uh, other uh, stink bugs because it has more of a tendency to lay eggs on fruit crops, not just the adults feeding on, on the fruit. And of course, as you know, uh, it has a tendency to, to overwinter in houses, which makes it a, a, a domestic problem. So a, a wide range, it's a, you can see what it does to apples. You see the, uh, the, the, the apple I've cut open there, and also in grapevines. And there's a, a concern over a stink bug taint uh, in, in crushed grapes. Uh, it does taint the juice. It's controversial whether now that taint is uh, stable. In, in a finished wine. Some lab, labs say yes, some lab, labs say no. Now, one, I want to point out the eggs here because uh, fruit growers often find the egg mass on the left because it's pretty showy. It's uh, also a stink bug uh, egg mass. Stink bugs lay barrel-shaped eggs. 
The ones on the right are brown marmoray sting bug. The one on the left is actually a beneficial. That's a predatory sting bug. It has some kind of gold-colored eggs with that real starburst pattern of respiratory horns around the, the lip of the, the barrel. Those little uh, micropylar horns are tiny in brown marmoray stink bugs, so it's easy to tell these apart. But keep in mind that the one that you'll see on the, on the left is actually a beneficial species, and you don't want to destroy those in your planting. Uh, stink bugs feed between the druplets on raspberry and cause the druplets to collapse. And so that's a, a symptom that you can be looking for on, on caneberries. Uh, I want to touch a little bit on, on borers. And with a couple of comments on primocane versus fluorocane bearing varieties. Uh, you, most of you know the, the life cycle of, of, of cane berries, where you know, in the, the older style, the fluorocane bearing, you take out the old fluorocanes and leave the primocanes there to be the fluorocanes the next year. With primocane bearing, you remove the whole plant uh, during the winter, well, the, 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 the canes in, in the wintertime, and you grow it more or less uh, as an annual crop. That has a big bearing on these borers that overwinter in the canes, uh, in, in, in uh, a galled tissue. And so that's a cultural control that can help uh, suppress your, your populations. This is raspberry crown borer. Uh, if, you, if you know you have this, I'd appreciate you letting me know too, because this one I think is underdiagnosed. It's more cryptic than the others. The, the adult is a moth, but it's a yellow jacket mimic. It looks like a yellow, yellow jacket. If you want to tell the difference, uh, there is a way you can tell visually. You don't actually have to pick it up to see if it's a yellow jacket. It's, uh, yellow jackets have a narrow wasp waist. This moth has a broad waist. And so although it has yellow and black stripes, uh, it is a moth and has other moth characteristics in the antennae and in the, in the body. So you should be able to quickly tell them apart. Uh, the eggs uh, incubate for a, a, a two weeks or, or a little bit more. And then they hatch. The uh, larvae will tunnel, uh, drop down to the uh, base of the plant and tunnel in to, uh, to the, the crown. Uh, there is some biological control with entomopathogenic nematodes. Uh, the, the efficacy of these is somewhat variable. Uh, depends a lot on soil moisture. They can't, ta can't take real dry conditions. They can't take standing water either. But, so uh, they, they can be effective if all the environmental conditions are right. Uh, cultural con control, infesting canes and crowns, uh, that should be practiced and uh, destroy these uh, after, after pruning. With all of the borers, if you can eliminate wild brambles that are nearby, that will help decrease the immigration pressure of the borers into your planting. We have a, a few um, uh, materials that are here. We have um, seven, uh, brigade and sniper. Now one thing about sniper is make sure uh, that you have what you think you have. That's a trade name that has been used for two very different products. It was one trade name for Azenfos methyl, which is gone now. And it's also a trade name for, um, for uh, bifenthrin, the same, as, uh, same product as, as Brigade. A newer product that's less disruptive of natural enemies is Alticor. That is also effective, uh, applied as a foliar spray. Rather than applying it as a drench, as with the, some of the older materials for raspberry crown borer, it's applied as a spray uh, towards the base of, pl of the plants. And this can be applied either in the fall or in the spring. Uh, okay. uh, redneck cane borer causes kind of a football-shaped elliptical gall up on the, the, the cane. This is a buprested beetle. This is in the same family as emerald ash borer, also bronze birch borer, uh, uh, quite a few others. Uh, about a, a quarter of an inch long with that coppery color pronotum, the section right behind the head. Uh, you can see they, under, in that gall area, they make uh, uh, some twisting tunnels up the, uh, the cane, and that uh, serves to girdle the plant so it weakens the plant above the, the gall. Uh, a cultural, in the interest of time, I won't leave this up, up here too long, but keep in mind that with the, the website I'll show you in the end, you can find a lot more detailed information on each of these species. Now, on, the, on your cane berries, if you see a D-shaped exit hole, that is uh, uh, typical of all the buprestids. You know, the emerald ash borer, um, the, there's one on apple, for example. Uh, but this is the only buprestid that's going to be in your raspberry or blackberry. So that means you have, uh, that's a, a symptom of um, 
redneck cane borer. So cultural control, removing gall canes in the dormant season. And again, if you have a primocane bearing crop and you're removing all of the canes uh, down by the ground level, that will help suppress the population of redneck cane borer. Chemical control, we, you know, there are insecticides that we have uh, registered, Malathion and, and, and Brigade, but the, the, um, the, the, the cultural control of pruning uh, combined with the removal of wild hosts that are adjacent, uh, that will go a long way towards uh, suppressing the population. Um, also, Admire Pro applied to the soil. There are issues with uh, the neonicotinoids, and I'll come to uh, them back uh, towards the end of the talk. Uh, the label says, do not apply pre-bloom or during bloom or when bees are actively foraging. Well, think of the way raspberries grow. You know, they're, they're blooming and bearing and being harvested all continually at the same time. So that will really limit the ability to use these products uh, for, for control of uh, any of these pests. Uh, raspberry cane borer, this is another one that's pretty easy to control without using sprays. You can use insecticides, but if you're watchful, and uh, remove the, the wilted tips promptly, uh, you can uh, remove most of the damage that way. This also, also has a reddish colored pronotum, but it's easy to tell from the last species because it's a longhorn beetle. It has very long antennae, about twice as long. It's about a half inch long. It, this is the one that makes a pair of ring -like, uh, rings of punctures around the, the tip of the, the, the shoot. And uh, in the early summer, these uh, tips will wilt. The larva will start to tunnel down the, the chute, and it'll go all the way down to the, the, the ground level. But if you remove that tip just after the wilting appears, you can remove uh, the insect. And so that is a, a non-chemical way of, of uh, combating this, this one. Also, Impede is an insecticidal soap that's uh, OMRI certified. That it can be effective as well. Now, about the neonicotinoids, most of you have probably heard of the concern with, uh, with pollinators. And I have a longer talk on this that I'm not going to um, subject you to today, but there are really two issues here that get confused in the public mind. One is the issue with colony collapse, and that's, colony collapse is a, is a real problem, and it's, it's serious, but there's a whole range of factors that play into that. You know, neonicotinoids are one risk factor in this overall syndrome. The other issue here is outright bee toxicity. You may remember a couple of years ago, there was a big bee kill in Oregon, where uh, a commercial applicator had sprayed neonicotinoids on blooming linden trees, killing thousands of bumblebees that were foraging on a tree. Well, that caused a, a big news story. Oregon banned that product. Uh, but really, you know, the public confuses that outright bee toxicity with colony collapse. Colony collapse is when the field force disappears, even when in the presence of adequate food in the nest and brood in the nest. They just don't come back. It's from sublethal uh, factors. And again, there's a variety of factors that relate to uh, colony collapse. There's varroa mites, which weaken the hives. There are uh, a bunch of different varieties, eight of which, uh, I'm sorry, about 24 different viruses, eight of which are transmitted by varroa mites. Uh, bees are also, in this country, overworked. Uh, because for uh, commercial pollination services, where half of the commercial beehives in the country are, are taken to California for almond pollination. Well, that's a lot of trekking around for the honeybees. And so that imposes stress on them. So, and neonicotinoids, some of the more toxic ones, uh, are, are probably an issue too. But it's really a, a suite of risk factors. Now, they're not all equivalent. Uh, two of them are a somewhat different chemical group. Uh, acid amoprid and thiocloprid, that's a sale and calypso. They're less toxic than uh, most of the others, like uh, Admire and uh, Actara, et, et, et cetera. And so if you're going to use a neonicotinoid, you can try and choose one that is, that is less toxic to honeybees. So who is to blame for CCD, calling collapse disorder? Uh, this is from the old Pogo comic strip. We have met the enemy and he is us. Really, uh, you know, insecticides are an easy target. And there is a, a, a dark history that we have to remember uh, going way back to the 60s, DDT and, and Silent Spring, uh, which was affecting raptors and waterfowl, et, et cetera. More recently, we had problems with granular furidan and bald eagles in, uh, here in Virginia. 
So uh, pesticides have had, had, had their problems. Uh, public perception of insecticides. As far as the public is concerned, we may as well still be spraying DDT and uh, parathion. They don't understand that most of the pesticides we use now are much safer for farm workers, natural enemies, etc., than a lot of the older ones. There are some examples, like the pyrethroids being so toxic to natural enemies. Uh, pesticide companies push neonicotinoids, and farmers choose them. So that's some of the blame, if you want to call it that. Now, keep in mind, there are reasons why farmers use them and chemical companies push them. They're safer for people. They're systemic, so they get to the pest better. But it is part of the problem with, with, uh, with bees. Farmers tend to plant fence to fence with uh, fewer wild sources of, of food for the honeybees. There, there have been some studies that showed that the bees could withstand having some neonicotinoids in the environment if they had alternative sources of forage to, to feed on. They need a diverse set of diet uh, sources themselves. Homeowners, they also control weeds, alternate food plants for, for bees. And many of the over-the-counter preparations include neonicotinoids as well. Of course, there are fruit protection specialists where you know, we recommend these materials. Beekeepers, stressing the bees with the, the way they transport bees for pollination services. And uh, the government decreasing subsidies for honey production, increasing the focus on pollination services. So there are a lot of pieces in this puzzle, and simply banning one class of pesticide is not likely to fix the problem. There are a lot of other things that can be adjusted, though, a more diverse agriculture, more diverse plantings you know, to be uh, food sources for, for bees. Now, this year, uh, there, there's new labeling language on many of the more toxic to, uh, to bees uh, products, uh, pollinator label protection. So we see uh, in, in the very early part of the label, we see the, the um, general uh, um, warnings here for crops under uh, contracted pollination services and for crops not under contracted pollination services. Uh, uh, in the beginning of the crop use section, uh, more specific uh, warnings. Uh, this one is for Actera, one of the neonicotinoids, but we have specific comments for apples, citrus, and pears. So uh, we have further warning information on uh, the use of these products and, and bee protection. And then under each of the vulnerable crops, in this case, caneberries, there are some general warnings down at the bottom to refer back to those other sections, you know, the, the other pollinator uh, protection sections. So you shouldn't miss the warning language on the labels for the uh, neonicotinoids and honeybee protection. So, uh, so bear that in mind. And keep in mind that there are a couple that are somewhat safer than the others. Now, what we've done in our apple recommendations, and we'll probably do something like this in our small fruit, too. In 2014, we had uh, Actera and Calypso in our apple recommendations, starting from Thai Cluster. Actera, remember, is one of the more toxic materials. Calypso is one of the less toxic materials. And so as the sprays progressed, we added more neonicotinoids, regardless of, of the toxicity. Now, what we've done this year is we've taken out the more toxic ones until second cover, uh, with the feeling that the pre-bloom sprays would be most likely uh, resulting in residues in nectar and pollen. And they do, and these products do show up in nectar and pollen. That's part of the, uh, the concern. And so what we've done is, in order to you know, give time for late blooms to be out of the way and for bees to be removed from the orchard, we, we have the products coming back in, the more toxic ones coming back in at second cover. The idea here, here is to allow growers the benefits of the products w without exposing bees when they're most vulnerable to the, to the materials. And here is uh, my email address. And if you just Google Virginia Fruit website, uh, you, you, you should find it. Um, I thought I had the URL on here too, but it might be hidden underneath those images now. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, we have links there to the um, Virginia Pest Management Guide for Commercial for all, Small Fruit and Home Fruit. Also, we have linked the Southern Region uh, Pest Management Guides that the last two speakers uh, spoke of as well. So all of that information is linked in the Virginia Fruit website. <laughs> And just uh, that's the end of my talk. Before I uh, see if there's any time for questions, I'll just m mention one thing. Uh, Phil had mentioned um, the bacterial uh, scorch in, in blueberries and how it's the same 
microorganism, uh, uh, Xylella fastidiosa, that causes Pierce's disease in, in grapes. And he thought that, uh, you know, he indicated that we see that in uh, some parts of Virginia. Actually, uh, uh, in some years, the risk zone is expanded. Traditionally, the risk zone has been in the southeastern corner of Virginia, the, the tidewater area. Now, with warming winters, and win winters have been getting warmer, regardless of what you think from the last couple of weeks, um, we, we do have a lot of warm winters. You may remember some of the recent winters were no winters at all. And when you have a lack of a real cold winter, the following season is going to be worse for Pierce's disease. And so my graduate student, Anna Wallingford, showed that um, in a, after a mild winter, the, almost the entire state is in the high risk zone. So I, I have not run into the disease on blueberries, but probably some of the rain, same risk factors and changing distribution will be in play. It's the same bacterium with the same vectors. So that's, uh, Rafi, that's the end of my talk. Uh, uh, is there time?